Today I'm going to talk about Adorno and Horkheimer's critique of the culture industry. And this is going to be the second part of a lecture series, a planned lecture series on media theory, which started with a video in Walter Benjamin's essay on art in the age of technological reproducibility. And quite a few viewers reacted positively to our suggestion to turn this into a series on kind of lectures on media theory, 20th century media theory, and gonna look in the course of this series on some German, French, North American theorists, building up to uh, a theorist that I'm most familiar with personally, uh, Niklas Luhmann, who will come at the end. Uh, let me start with a short biographical note. Benjamin, who I talked about earlier, and Adorno and Horkheimer knew one another, and they share a lot of similarities in their biography. They grew up in early 20th century Germany. They're heavily influenced intellectually by Hegel and Marx. They share a keen interest in politics with an interest in art. And importantly, of course, they're all Jewish, and they all had to flee uh, the Nazi regime and Nazi persecution. And Benjamin tragically committed suicide in 1940 on the run, whereas Horkheimer and Adorno had a successful academical career in the United States and then later returned to Germany and are known, all three of them are known as the founders of the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory. So I'll specifically talk about the chapter on culture industry, enlightenment as mass deception, which is included in Adorno and Horkheimer's book, Dialectic der Aufklärung, Dialectic of Enlightenment, which was written in 1944 in exile in the United States and then published a few years later in 1947, I believe. I will zoom in on their critique of the culture industry in four steps. First, I'm going to talk about the notion of dialectic, then about the notion of enlightenment, then about the combined notion of dialectic of enlightenment. And then finally, about the critique of the culture industry, mass media, film, radio, print media. These are all parts of the cultural industry for them. So first about dialectic. When doing a little research uh, for this video, I found this article on The New Yorker by Alex Ross titled The Naysayers, published a while ago, September 2014. And it contains this uh, little bit curious point. Uh, Ross writes, the word dialectic, as elaborated in the philosophy of Hegel, causes endless problems for people who are not German. It indicates an argument that maneuvers between contradictory points. Such twists and turns come naturally in the German language, whose sentences are themselves plotted in swerves. Now, I think overall, this is a very good short explanation of what dialectic is, and of course, what the American problems with it are. Uh, but interestingly, the sentence itself contains a little bit of a, an American problem, namely by saying that dialectic includes a kind of argument. However, as a method of thinking or writing, dialectic, I would say, is precisely not about making an argument, but as Ross says about analyzing contradictions. I did a search on an electronic versions of Hegel's phenomenology of the spirit, and not to my surprise, it looks like it doesn't include the word argument even a single time. The book is very large. So arguments are basically, from a dialectic perspective, somewhat one-sided and aim at identifying what is right and eliminating what is wrong. Dialectic, however, analyzes a dialogical process and aims at making sense of all sides in relation to one another and in their development. So arguments tend to focus on establishing what is the case, whereas dialectic focuses on describing contradictory forces constituting processes, developments, history. So importantly, again, dialectic views such history not as some form of linear progress, but as something like an antagonistic spiral where things are constantly turned on their head. Just to give you some concrete examples, whatever, the German Green Party, they started out as super pacifist. Now they're the most militaristic party in Germany. From a dialectical perspective, that's not a surprise. Not that different from Christianity on a much larger scale, which started out as a religion emphasizing love and then historically turned out to be a war machine or the age of authenticity, where the quest for originality becomes completely unoriginal. By the way, this exposition of dialectic itself is dialectic, 
rather than argumentative. Now about the notion of enlightenment in its, let's say, German version. Kant wrote the famous essay, Answer to the Question, What is Enlightenment? And it begins with a very short answer, which I'm quoting in my own translation. So Kant says, enlightenment is humanity's exit from the immaturity for which itself is at fault. Immaturity is the incapacity to use one's intellect without guidance by others. So enlightenment is the historical period where reason-based or intellect-based, individual maturity, individual independence, individual autonomy, freedom, creativity, and subjectivity arise. But it's not just individual. Importantly, this rise of independence, autonomy, freedom, creativity, subjectivity is manifested in and empowered by sociopolitical institutions. So enlightened individuals and an enlightened society depend on one another. It's a form of socially supported sovereign individuality, to use a terminology by our friend Jordan Peterson. Or in my own terminology, it's authenticity. Now then, importantly, a little bit later for Hegel, enlightenment is manifested not only individually, existentially in an individual's mind and socially, politically in the institutions of a society, but more broadly also in the zeitgeist, in the spirit of the times. It's historically embedded in everything, in culture, in art, in our way of life, in how we think, in ethics, in ideology. Adorno and Horkheimer refer to precisely this concept of enlightenment. They say, enlightenment understood in the widest sense as the advance of thought has always aimed at liberating human beings from fear and installing them as masters. Enlightenment's program was the disenchantment of the world. It wanted to dispel myth, to overthrow fantasy with knowledge. So in this definition, they emphasize mastery. That's an important element of maturity. Masters are in control. They're empowered. They have sovereignty. They have agency. Now Adorno and Horkheimer here also say, that enlightenment produces a form of disenchantment. They use the term by Max Weber and Zauberung here. So it also emphasizes rational knowledge that moves beyond religion and that enables an age of science and technology. To emphasize this, Adorno and Horkheimer also say the mind conquering superstition is to rule over disenchanted nature. Knowledge which is power knows no limits, Technology is the essence of this knowledge. So enlightenment combines the rise of the sovereign individual with the rise of technology. Now, importantly, in their understanding of sovereign individuality, Adorno and Horkheimer depart from Jordan Peterson in a very important way because they are actually fans of Marx. They're rooted in Marxism as well. So they're very critical of capitalism as a mode of production that dialectically simultaneously enables and destroys sovereign individuality or authenticity or freedom or creativity. So for them, clearly enlightenment is not the end of history, but an ongoing self-contradictory historical development. They're very critical of the zeitgeist that the enlightenment has produced in the 20th century in the context of capitalism in the United States, where it's turning itself against itself under conditions of fascism in Nazi Germany and in uh, the state communism in um, the Soviet Union. These three political and economic structures represent three different forms of the dialectic of enlightenment. Maybe as a footnote, Adorno was also famously very critical of the 68 student leftist protest movement. He was not woke. And this rejection for him is probably also rooted in his analysis of the dialectics of enlightenment. Shortly before his death, in an additional preface written to the new edition of the Dialectic of Enlightenment in 1969, Adorno gives a very short description of the zeitgeist that characterizes the specific dialectic of enlightenment. Here, 
he talks about the Identität von Intelligenz und Geistesfreundschaft, the identity of intelligence and enmity against the spirit, if translated literally, a little less literally, the identity of intelligence and anti-intellectuality, or even less literally, but maybe more to the point, the identity of intelligence and idiocy, a very contemporary manifestation of this identity of intelligence and idiocy is chat GPT. It's a contradictory synthesis of highest intelligence and complete non-intelligence. In the context of this technological identity of intelligence and idiocy, Adorno and Horkheimer speak in this preface also of a reversal of enlightenment into positivism or of the myth of that which is the case. We might say the myth of the argument. Under this heading of the identity of intelligence and idiocy, I want to go back to the actual text and the preface of 1944. There, Adorno and Horkheimer write, what we had set out to do was nothing less than to explain why humanity, instead of entering a truly human state, is sinking into a new kind of barbarism. So they basically want to talk about the self-destruction of Enlightenment humanism. Uh, they further say, in the present collapse of bourgeois civilization, the tireless self-destruction of Enlightenment, public life has reached a state in which thought is being turned inescapably into a commodity and language into celebration of the commodity. So here they critique capitalism as a commodification basically of spirit, of thought and of language in society, in public life. They say the individual is entirely nullified in face of the economic powers, while individuals as such are vanishing before the apparatus they serve, they are provided for by that apparatus and better than ever before. So they talk about an industrialized mass society, where on the one hand we have material well-being, along with complete spiritual emptiness, which fosters a very contradictory non-individuality or inauthenticity. And this happens in the context of the new media at the time. They write, the flood of precise information and brand new amusements, entertainment, make people smarter and more stupid at once. So again, mass media, the culture industry, manifests this very identity of intelligence and idiocy. Instead of empowering sovereign individuals, the culture industry, mass media, simulates a false individuality. It produces inauthentic art and inauthentic artists. And this is especially visible in the mass uniformity and standardization that is produced by the culture industry. They write, for the present, the technology of the culture industry confines itself to standardization and mass production. And this is also the case for artistic creativity. In the zeitgeist, art now is also mass produced, mass consumed and standardized. They write, films and radio no longer need to present themselves as art. The truth that they are nothing but business is used as an ideology to legitimize the trash they intentionally produce. They call themselves industries. So we clearly see that a capitalist commodification in a traditional Marxist way is responsible for this industrialization of culture. What happens is a transformation of the traditional mode of production of culture by artistic geniuses connected to an aura in Benjamin's terminology to a mode of production that produces mass consumable trash. And this all happens within an industrial functionality. You're right. Just as the occupants of city centers are uniformly summoned for purposes of work and leisure as producers and consumers, so the living cells crystallize into homogeneous, well-organized complexes. In this mass society characterized by uniformity and standardization of production and consumption, even housing, work and free time 
are all standardized. We live in a gigantic Fordist world where human creativity and individuality are basically produced in the form of a factory, mechanized, de-individualized, functionalized. So they say entertainment is the prolongation of work under late capitalism. It is sought by those who want to escape the mechanized labor processes so that they can cope with it again. So mass entertainment, mass media support and importantly mirror the mindless and joyless industrial functionality which governs all aspects of life, including free time. This produces an interesting phenomenon. They write, according to this tendency, life is to be made indistinguishable from the sound film. This indistinguishability, this seamless connection between the culture industry and the actual industry, where two are just two different forms of the same ongoing standard uniform way of life, connects with what Herbert Marcuse described in a very influential book as the one-dimensional man, the one-dimensional human being, which was published 20 years later in 1964. And of course, Marcuse is also an important figure in critical theory and the Frankfurt School. So this one-dimensionality is produced by the cultural industry in intricate connection with the actual industry. There's no creativity, no rebellion, there's a total conformity, there's no freedom. Freedom is basically generated to a constant repetition of the same. And here, original art is lost. Adorno and Horkheimer speak of a fusion of culture and entertainment. Here, amusement is now experienced only in facsimile in the form of cinema photography or the radio recording. And they say, referring to a few artists popular at the time, at all its levels, from Hemingway to Emil Ludwig, from Miss Miniver to the Lone Rangers, from Toscanini to Guy Lombardo, intellectual products drawn ready-made from art and science are infected with untruth. And every film is a preview of the next which promises yet again to unite the same heroic couple under the same exotic sun. So that basically repeats Benjamin's point. Originals, art originals, have been replaced by sameness. Artworks are now copies, produced no longer for truth, but for mass consumption and for distraction, diversion, entertainment. In Adorno's and Horkheimer's terminology, artworks have become ready-made cliches. And they say that the difference between the models of Chrysler and General Motors is fundamentally illusory, is known by any child. It's no different with the offerings of Warner Brothers and Metro Goldwyn Mayer. Because the technical media too are being engulfed by an insatiable uniformity. So it's all about uniformity again, even in artistic production. There's no originality anymore. And importantly, this also leads to the replacement of subjective expression in art with conformity to style. Adorno and Horkheimer write, the great artists were never those whose works embodied style in its least fractured, most perfect form but those who adopted style as a rigor to set against the chaotic expression of suffering is a negative truth. Up to Schoenberg and Picasso, great artists have been mistrustful of style, which at decisive points has guided them less than the logic of the subject matter. So it seems that the great artists are largely gone. Now reproduction of style is all that matters. No original expression of unique experience, no authenticity. And precisely therefore, Adorno and Horkheimer say, because of this ubiquity, the film star with whom one is supposed to fall in love is from the start a copy of himself. And today, every close-up of a film actress is an advert for her name. Or from the standardized improvisation in jazz to the original film personality who must have a lock of hair straying over her eyes so that she can be recognized as such, pseudo-individuality reigns. 
the individual, the unique artist has disappeared. Now artists are copies of one another, similar stars, celebrities marketed as commodities. Inauthenticity reigns. And tragically, this also means the loss of agency. They write, the step from telephone to radio has clearly distinguished the roles. The former liberally permitted the participant to play the role of subject. The latter, the radio, democratically makes everyone equally into listeners in order to expose them in authoritarian fashion to the same programs. So individual agency, as represented in telephone conversations, is gone and has been replaced by a new technology, by radio, where people are just passive consumers, mass audience, rather than active producers. This theme is later taken on by other media theorists and, of course, plays a huge role in the debates about new media, which have often been praised to overcome the limits of radio and television and to re-enable agency to take place. But that was long after Adorno and Horkheimer. Now, for Adorno and Horkheimer, in the face of radio and television and the culture industry, a dialectic of individuality is clearly visible. They write, The principle of individuality was contradictory from the outset. The individual on whom society was supported was the product of society's economic and social apparatus. So that's a fundamental insight here, that in modernity, the modern individual was never simply the constituent of society, but to use a postmodern phrase, always already also a product of society. It was already shaped by collectivity at the same time. And this dialectic now takes on the following form for Adorno and Horkheimer. They say, against the will of those controlling it, Technology has changed human beings from children into persons, but all such progress of individuation has been at the expense of the individuality in whose name it took place. So the dialectic of individuality has produced, so to speak, false individuality. While enlightenment, capitalism and technology did in one way mature people, and created modern technological individualism, this individualism is at the same time false, inauthentic, and paradoxical. It's a self-contradictory mass individualism. So, per conclusion for Adorno and Horkheimer, the culture industry, as commodified mass media, manifests the dialectical zeitgeist of the identity of intelligence and idiocy, a complete inauthenticity of culture as culture industry, of individuals as non-individuals. Yeah. So if Adorno and Horkheimer were alive today, they would probably say that AI and social media, like ChatGPT or like YouTube and philosophical channels on YouTube like this one, manifest the spirit of identity of intelligence and idiocy even more obviously. But then the dialectic never stops and the new technologies may also be analyzed with newer and more timely post-authentic theory reflecting the age of post-authenticity and its zeitgeist. Adorno and Horkheimer, like many 20th century theorists, are still somewhat stuck in the age of authenticity. And they also took part to an extent in the production of that jargon of authenticity that, as Adorno said, Heidegger was producing. So the next video that we have in mind for this series will be on to North American media theorists, Marshall McLuhan and Noam Chomsky.